Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other world. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. Here, O oh my people, my Torah, incline your ears to the utterances of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a proverb. I will declare riddles from ancient times which we have heard and known and which our fathers told to us. We will not hide it from their sons, recounting the Psalms of the Lord to a later generation and his might and the wonders that he performed. And he established a witness among those of the house of Jacob and he decreed a Torah among those of the house of Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their sons, so that another generation, sons still to be born, should know they will arise and tell it to their children, and they will place their hope in God and not forget the works of God, and they will keep his commandments. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen, and I'm happy and honored to be joined this evening by Kathy Dunson. Kathy, are you there, sister? Yes, I'm here. Good evening. Well, I hope you feel better. Oh, um, thanks. <laughs> but most certainly, you know, to all, if it gets too much for you, just let me know. Um, okay, if I fall down, I'll yelp out. <laughs> right. All right. Well, um, this evening, the the show and the topic is about truth the ancient text and also condemnation without investigation which there seems to be a lot of that going around definitely no shortage of it and um and i'm not usually ever one to get involved in you know the the very many people which there are numerous ones that attack me um even daily sometimes but that are just um you know condemning me for bringing forth truth from the ancient text and sharing that with you um because that's basically all that I do is study from the ancient text and in sharing the things that I've learned the discernment that I've been blessed by the Most High to now have and the revelations which I've been led to, I am just basically uh, sharing with you the things that I've learned and then quoting from all of these ancient texts. And in the books that I write, that's exactly what I do as well. I share what I've learned and then I give you all the source references. And in each one of my books, there are hundreds. And so, you know, for those that, uh, you know, value my work and that value the ancient texts and that, like myself, have um, deemed that in order to glean truth, that we really should go to the ancient sources and to the accounts, the visions, the prophecies of the ancient prophets that, um, you know, what better confirming witness is there for God, uh, God's testimony and the, the gospel as shared by the various patriarchs and prophets? I mean, what better way to learn truth and to learn about the creator and creation than from the narrative which was inspired and handed and passed down through uh, the prophets through time and generation? And so 
that's all that I'm trying to do is provide you that material. Um, and it's been impressed upon my heart that, you know, we are very blessed, fortunate, and lucky, and essentially spoiled because we have access to all of this information, whereas in generations past, people have been subjugated, have been um, controlled and placed into a bubble and not given the keys to the kingdom, not even allowed to read the scriptures for themselves for the longest time. The the masses uh, were kept out of the loop as far as, you know, having translations which they could read and study from for themselves. And they always had an intercessory, an uh, intermediary, somebody that they had to go to in order to gain insight, these supposed vicars of the of Most High God, you know, like the Pope and the Catholic Church. And information has been controlled for thousands of years, and it's only now um, recent, you know, with the the printing press and the publication of all the scriptures and the uh, just mass production of all of these various uh, stories and scriptures and biblical texts and and just wisdom texts and not just from Christianity or Judaism but from all over the world all the cultures all the peoples all the civilizations and so since that time, there has been a flood of information which has come forth that has allowed people that are interested and in wanting to know that are willing to put forth the effort. It allows us to gain insight into what truth is and what it may be. And so, you know, we're very fortunate and very lucky. And in looking at what truth means, and I'll get you to comment on this here in a, in a second, Kathy, but I just want to set the premise for the the show. In looking up the definition for the word truth, you it, it reads as, uh, truth is most often used to mean being in accord with fact or reality or fidelity to an original or standard. And uh, Truth may also often be used in modern context to refer to an idea truth to self or authenticity, the truth, the real facts about something, the things that are true, the quality or state of being true, a statement or idea that is true or accepted as true. And um, in looking and trying to come to what truth really is, I found this quote from somebody and I thought it was appropriate and interesting. It says this, uh, how to find truth. The truth can only come from a source without the filters of time, proximity, translation, or bias. True truth or absolute truth cannot be told one to another, nor can it be read and discerned by a man living in the here and now without outside influence of a, of a being devoid of filters. So the only truth can come from a supreme being that can see all and know all regardless of time and space. God being omniscient is the source of all absolute truth. One must read the scriptures but can misinterpret them if not guided by the Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Careful and prayerful scripture reading can and will provide truth actually revealed by God using the scriptures as catalysts. And in James chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Kathy, would you like to comment? Um, I was looking earlier. There's a, a Bible that I've had called Sefer. I don't know if you're aware of it. 
Um, it's a, a friend of mine, actually, she and her husband are part of the publishing um, group of that book. And they had um, at restored uh, the sacred name and um, awesome. Aleph Tav. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting that wrong. Ale, uh, anyway. Aleph Tav, yeah. Yes, thank you. And um, also the Apocrypha and um, the uh, books from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Jubilees, Enoch, all of that. And they had a preface to that book, and, and there's some really interesting tidbits there. Uh, they said the term apocrypha is derived from the Greek word meaning hidden or secret. Originally, the meaning of the term may have been complementary in that the term was applied to sacred books whose contents were too exalted to be made available to the general public. And then they had Daniel right there, Daniel 12, 9 through 10. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Yes. And even in the, the book of Enoch, he talks about how his vision and what he was writing is for a distant generation, a remote generation, people in the, you know, in the future, which are being the final generation, in my opinion. And I talk about this in my ninth book. I show that we are the fig tree generation and that what Yeshua speaks about as far as the blooming of the fig tree, that that was the nation of Israel being recreated. And no matter if you think that was Rothschild, or uh, which it was, you know, there was a, a lot of the powers that be in the synagogue of Satan, those that say they are Jews and are not, uh, had influence in bringing about Jew, uh, Zionism and the Jewish state. But again, everything only happens and is only allowed to happen if God so deems it to you know, necessary or is part of the greater plan, which everything is prophetic and is following um, what he has laid out in prophecy. And so anyways, um, one third of the scriptures are written for the last generation, the last days, the end of days, the end times. And so we are seeing the unfoldment of much of that material. And so, which is another reason why I know certain aspects of the scriptures and those things that I study from are inspired by God is because of the prophetic nature of them and that they are 100% accurate and have, like in the, the vision, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the the statue made of gold and silver and brass and iron and clay uh, and how that was fulfilled over thousands of years, the different kingdoms that came and rose af after Babylon um, and that came and went, that it took thousands of years for that prophecies and those prophecies associated to be fulfilled. And it's only somebody that has the vision and has the understanding, the foresight and the um, prophetic ability to share um, in story what, how, and how all of that will unfold. I mean, that absolutely shows that only God could deem and, and you know, inspire such um, scriptures and such texts. And so... Um, I think today that um, we see people disdaining looking after wisdom um, and looking after knowledge. You have provided a, a great service for so many. I know I have read only a handful of, of the text myself in full, but I look to your books as a way to see um parts of those texts and how they fit together, how they align with scripture itself. And it's confirming witness to things or illuminating, giving more information, more detail on what was um, part of God's plan. 
so I'm really grateful for that. I, I know in uh, the most recent book, uh, Firmament Vaulted Dome of the Earth, it's so incredible to see the way that you laid out the text for um, the ascension through the different levels, the patriarchs, different patriarchs ascension through different levels of heaven. It's just phenomenal. And I would never have been able to find that, but the discernment that you've developed is what is bringing that to us. And that's, you know, a real gift that God has given to you. And, and I think we all are better for that. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I think so as well, because in studying the information and coming to learn all these different perspectives and all these different angles, it has helped to clarify a lot that had remained ambiguous to me um, concerning the not just, you know, just the canon, because the stories of the canon, even like take, for instance, the story of Yeshua, our Savior, Messiah, our King, our Lord. There's only one story of his earlier childhood, you know, that it, it speaks about the virgin birth. And then all of a sudden, one story when he was 13 and how he left uh, his parents and they found him at the temple and then nothing until he shows up on the scene and is uh, teaching and doing miracles. And yet when you study the um, extra biblical text, you get a whole lot of information on his early childhood, his youth, um, even his, you know, young adult life, um, I mean, all of that, that's just one of the aspects. So, and, you know, for people that worship and honor and give thanks to Yeshua for um, the saving grace and for being the Passover lamb, for the forgiveness of sins and that know him to be God incarnate, um, they don't know much about him other than the stories that are contained in the gospel narrative as far as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the red letter, you know, um, and for those that do honor Yeshua, Savior, Messiah, why would you not want to know right. everything you could learn about him and his life? And even Mary, I mean, the stories of Mary and how um, she was also uh, a very um, just honorable and she was nurtured in the temple and fed by the angels and um, you know the story of her parents Joachim and Anna all these different things are left out um, the story of even how Joseph uh, was a widowed man an elderly man and came to be the caretaker of Mary um, all of those things add to and give great insight and in, in-depth um, as far as the, the stories of Christ's childhood, even Mary. And, and so why wouldn't you want to know all those things? And so for people to just ignore all of the other material that is out there is just beyond me because, in, in my opinion, it's like trying to uh, put a puzzle together and yet having all these missing pieces, you know? Um, you, there's no way you can get, and we're not talking about missing pieces for those that only study the canon, the 66 bit canon. There are thousands, tens of thousands of texts out there, um, and that the early church, the ecclesia, the those that came up and are now called Christians, you know, they they had access to and studied and read from, uh, even Yeshua, even the, the canon itself talks about so many texts that we no longer have access to. Um, there's dozens, you know, like uh, maybe even a hundred, maybe not that many, but there are many, many books mentioned in the canon itself that we no longer have access to. And for people to just not be willing to study all this outside of information because they call it Gnostic or call it whatever labels they want to yeah, place upon it. Yeah. Um, and to ignore it is to me, it's like you're helping because they've been trying to keep Yeshua says in one of the passages that the 
scribes and the Pharisees have been hiding the keys to the kingdom and keeping it from you. And it's like you're aiding them in doing that. And um, it just doesn't make sense to me because, again, truth, in order to glean truth and to come to understanding and better, uh, more insightful understanding on the gospel and our relationship with not only the creator, but creation, uh, if you have to study the ancient material and not just a small portion of it, but as much of it as you can. Um, and when you do, the things that I teach are the things that you're going to come to discernment upon. And even though they are, um, you know, so many are critical of so many aspects of so many things that I teach, I'm not just teaching from, you know, something that I made up in my own mind, but I give you the source and, and the many sources from all the many different texts. Um, not just, you know, the canon, even though that is my foundation, but even with, you know, the English translations of the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, that the, one of the reasons why I study and share from the Targums is, you know, they are, in my opinion, closer to the original source, and they predate the English translations by 1,500 years. And they are the original Aramaic translations of the original Hebrew Torah, which were used in the Holy Temple when the uh, Hebrew people came, the Israelites returned from their Babylonian exile. And having been, um, having lived there for 70 years during the time of Daniel while he was in Babylon and, um, all the other prophets that were there in Babylon. Um, they just they, didn't understand the language, right? That they well, were being... Yeah, they right. had they learned Aramaic, and uh, right. that so was the came, language of the day, yeah. Yeah, so when they came back, they, they didn't understand what they were being taught, so they had to stop, and they wanted it written down in for them. Right. So that's what, how that So they could study through. and read. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is what the Hebrews studied when they returned from their exile, the Targum, not the King James, not the other English translations. They studied from the Targum, and they shared that, and that was their Bible. And so for people to, you know, discount all of the Targums just because they say things that they may not agree with, like, for instance, the serpent seed or, um, and other things of that nature, um, is just ludicrous because again these are the things that they themselves studied going all the way back to the first century ce during the time of yeshua and so um but anyways i, I wanted to share one thing really quick because it, even though i usually don't do this kind of thing um but because i'm being criticized so very often now, I, I just wanted to address it. And that is one of the reasons why I'm doing the show that I'm doing this evening and talking about the topics that we're covering. But I just wanted to share with the listeners, those of you that um, come and listen to my shows, that study my work, because, you know, I think that many of you are very wise and very discerned in your own search and your seeking in that like what we were talking about in trying to understand and find truth that you are looking and reading from the ancient text yourself and that you are not allowing yourself to be only put in a box but you are stepping outside to read things like the book of Enoch the book of Jasher Jubilees and so many of these other texts in order to get better understanding of the story and those things that are talked about in the gospel. And so for that, I applaud you. But because we do these kind of things, uh, we are often criticized. And I'm going to just share something uh, which, you know, will illustrate that. And, and then I'm going to go into some teachings from Christ, which will help to establish 
how we should be with one another um, and that, you know, we are to share and to approach each other in love and to be able to, even if we have disagreements, that we should be able to come together in discourse and talk about um, whatever it is that we're learning, the revelations we're being led to, um, even the disagreements that we have in order to learn from one another. But those that just criticize and judge and that never have even read the material from themselves or even have read or studied any of my books and that yet just criticize me because they disagree with some of the things that I teach or some of the things that I share, um, I ask you to ask them why it is that they don't believe whatever is their opinion, whatever is their stance, why it is that they think one way or the other. Because I always share in the shows that I do, in the books that I write, uh, the interviews that I do, I always share why it is that I believe what I have come to know. And I give you all of the ancient sources, all of the material, so that you can go and study it for yourself and then make determination on whether you agree with me or not and whether that becomes true for you and whether you are led to similar revelation. But um, let me get you to comment on that first, Kathy, and then I'm going to share this. Well, I don't even know a lot of times um, in the day we live in today if people are even taking the time to listen or to read the information because it's it's more of a drive-by comment you know people are adversarial and i'm not sure you know what has created this monster but it is a monster i had a person who, I, who commented on the recent interview you did on now you see tv um that you didn't know the bible and um oh and they said well i had i copied it um they said that the okay the earth was created perfect and there was no war in heaven that changed the earth the war in heaven does not happen till the end of days this guy does not know the bible and i just said that's not what the scripture says and to use the strongs and they would know but it started a a ream of attack mm -hmm. uh we'll be right back but we know who uh instigates controlled opposition we'll be right back Our power is in the chronic shortness of food and physical weakness of the worker, because by all that this implies, he is made the slave of our will, and he will not find in his own authorities either strength or energy to set against our will. Hunger creates the right of capital to rule the worker more surely than it was given to the aristocracy by the legal authority of kings. And this is uh, from the Protocols of the Learned Elders yeah. of Zion. And they're basically talking about, um, you know, how they are creating um, and forcing us to just struggle to survive so that we never have time, energy, or ability to focus on learning about uh, God and the things of um you know, absolutely they, yeah. i went i went back this week and um what what did i watch uh oh i watched uh corbett's century of enslavement and some g edward griffin every once in a while i'll watch some of those things just kind of refresh but i mean if you start out looking at the central bank and banking system and what they've done and, and get an understanding i mean <sighs> the bay all wars are bankers wars and still one of my favorite documentaries which is more mainstream and i think people can um show this to their friends and family who are not awake it's called shadow ring from free mind film and it's uh, sorbo uh, i forget his first name the actor he um does the narration so you know that's a really good one talking about the wars i mean it goes back over a century and uh, yeah it's been going on a long time right and i i you know as far as um 
Yeah, in fact, I'm going to read one other passage. This goes along with what you said. Uh, it says, before us is a plan in which is laid down strategically the line from which we cannot deviate without running the risk of seeing the labor of many centuries brought to naught. Uh, and talking about, you know, just the, the how they have been preparing and planning uh, for well, all of these for to, so very long. That goes back to truth, because what we've when you when you wake up at this point, you realize what you've been taught, what you've been given in the media is all a pack of lies. Right. Right. It's, it's hard to it's hard to um, to accept all of that and, and and, you know, realize, OK, how do you get through all of this? I mean, I cannot watch the news channels anymore. I used to. And I was thinking I'm keeping a pulse on, you know, what they are saying. Now I just I maybe it's the political season, but right. you know, I just I can't even take it. It's it's so bad. Yeah, I, I don't waste my time doing all that anymore. Every once in a while, I'll look into it just to see, you know, what they're trying to uh, get the public to buy into. But um, for the most part, I try to avoid all that because the opposition is controlled. And it's the same thing, like even with um you know, with Christians being at each other's throats or people exactly. being, being um, uh, minorities being created and then people's being put at odds with one another. That is how the, the, in the, even in the protocols, that's how they have said how they can control us and how they weaken us and keep us distracted is by creating these oppositions or, you know, even with all the different trolls that come out and attack um, and that are leading astray uh, those that may be looking to certain people for uh, for truth, that it's always been this way, that they have always um, attacked the messenger. If they can't attack the message or if they can't, you know, if somebody is out there speaking truth, then they do everything they can to lead people away from their message and to try to prove that they're crazy or that they're, uh, you know, whatever negative associations and commentaries are levied against those people and uh, they're try to discredit them. And it's always, always been that way. And that's the modus operandi of Satan and the sons of Cain that have been, you know, they have perfected this technique and have utilized it and it works and it continues to work. Even in the political arena, the attack ads and the negative messages, you know, there's no real substance to yeah. the debates or to any resolutions or real solutions. They don't talk about anything that is and meaningful. The money. Right. All the money that's wasted and all of the, the time, you know, individuals time that is wasted. Think of, you know, people that could really be helped that the government's right. already destroying their lives through right. so many different methods. But yeah, um, it, well, it's like uh, the ancient texts. Uh, these things have been suppressed. And why would, yes. why, why should literature be called for forbidden? You know, I mean, who's going to benefit from that? Right. The, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a book. It's, uh, it's uh, some, you know, the book of Enoch was popular for 500 years until it went into obscurity until it was recently, you know, resurfaced in what the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they I, almost eradicated it. Yeah. The only one I see who benefits from that is Satan. Exactly. So that, I, you you exactly. got to wonder about that. And there are a lot of messianic themes in that book. There's right. and your recent revelation with, uh, you know, that other thing, <laughs> Uh, always, oh right, right. Yeah, with your last book before Firmament. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's huge in and of itself. Um, but all right, I'm gonna read this, and because I want to go into some of this um, just a little bit. This is, and I, I want to thank the listener that shared this with me. But this will give an idea of because not only are they attacking me, they're attacking all of you as well. Those of you that look to that use me as guidance and direction for finding and discovering your own truth. And so many of you sh share such positive messages with me uh, about how you have 
you know, come back to the truth and a reestablished relationship with the Most High God and with the the Son and the Holy Spirit. And and I thank all of you for, you know, sharing that with me and how much I've impacted your lives. But uh, this is what one of my listeners sent to me. And uh, he, he said this, Hey, Zane, I tried to find the comment on the main page of that particular video, but was unable to locate it again. However, I was able to copy and paste it from my Google messages. This is the accusation that was uh, levied against me. And of course, I'm not going to say any names, but many of you that study the, you know, the full gamut of uh, the different people that are working on truth and sharing it out there uh, might be familiar with this particular individual and his little uh, group. Um, but he said this about me. I don't read Gnostic books written by a New Ager that teaches Satan had sex with Eve and that Adam had homosexual relations with Satan, which I don't teach that at all. So, But anyways, um, you know, how they try to uh, label you and to apply untruths to you, um, same kind of thing. But anyways, no thanks, I will pass, and this is why I do not follow people like Zen any longer, because people like you that support him are just all kinds of crazy. Anyone reading this can see clear as day the weird mentality going on here, clearly not of sound mind nor a biblical doctrine, Looks like a witch casting spells in this thread. I did the very same research on the ferment long before Zen talked about it. Funny, I, I guess he thinks that I, I took his work, and yet he doesn't even study all the ancient texts that I study. Um, my previous videos show that the Bible teaches everything we need to know about the firmament. Zen used Gnostic, unbiblical texts like Enoch 2 and 3, which I didn't even quote from Enoch 3, but whatever, uh, and many others. So no thank you. I don't read garbage like that. Uh, I am very harsh on people that teach lies and mix truth with false doctrines. That is the duty of a watchman. Why do you think the Jews hated Paul and tried to stone him? I am held accountable for my actions to Christ. I am not here to please people with cleverly crafted fables nor tickle their ears i'm here to be a servant and teach the word you know it's so funny um well let me finish this real quick those are his comments sorry i could not do the screenshot i know it is a little confusing when you cannot see the entire conversation but this particular thread began when somebody said that others should look into your work uh and it's so funny that you know he would mention in this particular rant uh, about the Jews hating Paul um, and the same thing with them hating Christ. And it, the reason it's so funny is because um, they were the ones that are linked by Yeshua as being connected to the sons of Cain. And those those are the actions, their hatred and their conspiring to murder uh, both Paul and Yeshua, those are the actions of uh, the dark side, you know, the the evil, the uh, Satan, the adversary, the accusations, the railing accusations, and the um, coming from an angle of hate and not of uh, even trying to bring forth understanding, but, and also the holier-than-thou kind of that whole scenario. But anyways, I wanted to um, address a couple things that he said. And one is the word Gnostic, which, you know, so many people think Gnostic is such a negative and, and a dirty word, like it's a bad word. But when you look up Gnostic, the term uh, from the ancient Greek, Gnosticos, having knowledge, uh, Gnosis, knowledge, and elaborate in just a little more. Is a modern term categorizing a collection of ancient religions who, whose adherents shun the material world, which they viewed as created by the demiurge, and embrace the spiritual world. Gnostic ideas influence many ancient religions that teach that gnosis, variously interpreted as knowledge, enlightenment, salvation, 
uh, emancipation or oneness with God may be reached by practicing philanthropy to the point of personal poverty. Sexual abstinence, as far as for hearers, entirely uh, foreign, foreign, foreign initiates, uh, and diligently searching for wisdom by helping others. Um, and you know how Christ himself said that he was not of this world, that he was from above, that his kingdom was not of this world. And the Gnostics, or the so-called, you know, the, the Gnostics of old, they were teaching the same things. And the interesting thing is that just recently there was a whole collection, uh, those that don't know, the Nag Hammadi Codices found in 1945, which are texts that were protected and preserved and hidden um, in order to, to be you know, preserved for a latter day. And they are 1,600 years old, just, you know, like the Targum, they predate the English translations and all of the stories uh, that we have in the canon. And there are no others like them. I mean, like, we don't even have any of the stories that were found in this huge collection, which shows to what extent you know, these, because all of these books were preserved and protected and were important to this particular group of Essenes, which, you know, separated themselves from um, the the Pharisees and the church authorities and those that had taken over as being the so-called, you know, uh, keepers of the wisdom. They separated themselves for reason and they protected these text for reason and yet they're criticized because the texts are not understood and they're considered to be unbiblical but when you truly understand what they are talking about in my opinion and you read the text for yourself because uh yeshua is one of the main characters it's christ which is giving all of these teachings and a lot of the nag hamadi codices these so-called secret books they are books that were given to the apostles after he returned from his resurrection and people don't know that because they don't read it and so he's giving them all of the teachings without laying them out in parable and yet uh, everybody just labels them gnostic and never even reads them and has no understanding that these are the things that are being talked about and they line up with things that are spoken about in the scriptures. And I'll give you an example. Uh, from John chapter 8, it says, And he said unto them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, speaking to the Pharisees, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who are you? And Jesus says unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. Um, uh, I'll share just a, a couple other things. Talking about the difference in how he said that he is from above and that his kingdom is not of this world. And that our being in a fallen state, this is why there was a differentiation, a distinction between the world of the spirit and the world of the flesh and that we are told all throughout the scriptures just like the gnostics taught that we are to um side with our spiritual selves and not you know fall into and to identify with the physical aspect the carnal aspects of ourself and our world because we are a marriage um of the two, our our spirits are married to our flesh, and our flesh is a fallen form, a fallen state of being. Proverbs, the way of life is above to the wise, so that he may depart from hell below. Um, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And that's in reference to our bodies, which 
when we die, our bodies go ashes to ashes, dust to dust. They go back to the earth, but our spirits go on to either um, paradise or hell. Um, explaining a little bit more about Gnosticism, and then I'll get you to comment here in a second, Kathy. In Gnosticism, the world of the Demiurge is represented by the underworld, which is associated with flesh, time, and more particularly, the imperfect ephemeral world. The world of God is represented by the upper world and is associated with the soul and perfection. The world of God is eternal and not part of the physical. It is impalatable and timeless. The demiurge in Gnostic and other systems is a subordinate supernatural being who created the world and is regarded as the creator of evil. Now, I know a lot of people teach that the Gnostics believe that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is the Demiurge, and that's a complete lie. If you really study the actual Nakamati codices, they teach that the Demiurge is named Yaldabaoth, Samael, and Saklas. And uh, Yaldabaoth means child passed through here. Samael is the same, interestingly, as what the Targum references as the serpent or Satan. They call him Samael. And Saklas just means blind God. And I'll share a passage from the Targums which associates Samael as being the serpent. It says, And the woman beheld Samael, the angel of death, and was afraid, yet she knew that the tree was good to eat and that it was medicine for the enlightenment of the eyes and a desirable tree by means of which to understand. And she took of its fruit and did eat. And so there you see that Samael, the Demiurge, is connected to Samael, which is not the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh Elohim, but is in fact, when you look up the word Samael, it means this. In the Hebrew, the venom of God, poison of God, Samael, is an important archangel in Talmudic and post-Talmudic lore, a figure who is an accuser, Satan, seducer, and destroyer, and has been regarded as both good and evil. Rabbinical writings describe Samael as the guardian angel of Esau or a patron of Eden, Edom, the Roman Empire. He is considered in Talmudic texts to be a member of the heavenly host uh, with grim and destructive duties. One of Samael's greatest roles in Jewish lore is that of the main archangel of death. He remains one of Yahweh's servants even though he wants men to do evil. Now, um, we know that Satan is the angel of death and that it was because of him that death came into being. Now, there's so many passages in the Bible, and after I read just a couple of these, I'll get you to comment. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to go ahead and get you to comment because we're almost at the next break, and then I'll pick up when we return. So if you would. Well, what I'm seeing is there's always been differences in the um, in different bodies and sex. I mean, there are many sex back in, in Jesus' time in, and before um, looking for the Messiah. And this is what we have today in our world with all of the different denominations. And right. And what we have going on here is just more division and, and it's designed to destroy. It's not what Christ would have us do. And it's not what we were told to do. We should be building one another up. We should be applying our discernment. I mean, we were, we were told to, you know, search the scriptures daily and, and, yes. you know, to understand these things. And I don't think it's, it's been made like, you know, conspiracy theory, you know, th that's all, th these things have been made um, derogatory terms, just like you're saying with Gnostic. And there are other terms in Christianity that, 
you know, well, like the Apocrypha or Pseudepigrapha, you know, different books that we're not supposed right. we're not supposed to read. It's like, you know, what other books are you going to burn? And they're they're wanting to be the gateway for whatever knowledge, and they're just, you know, going to keep it from you. So I, I just I think what you do is a very positive thing. You present it to to a person with a scripture as well to to learn and to elucidate to um, use their own ability to think. It's it's like this one commenter on YouTube didn't understand what Strong's was and just you know told me I w- had itchy ears and I was trying to reinterpret the Bible. I said no, this is. You know, it's kind of like a dictionary. It's how the, the world was word was translated. So you could understand, you know, what it said in Genesis 1. And, you know, I was attacked for that. So that's kind of, that's what I see happening in this environment. It's really dumbed down. I see the comments being, no, that that's a bad thing. It's Gnostic and no explanation. Right, so right. That's what we're dealing with. Right. All right. We'll be right back for a second hour, everyone. All right, well, welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. And I thank those of you that uh, do stand up for truth and that do stand up for me when people are, you know, leveling accusations against me. And I, I'm really grateful for all of you. And I consider you family because, um, you know, the elect is but a small, a very few. And in which we're going to go into first John chapter three here in just a minute, because um, in, in my opinion, Yeshua tells us how we are to be with one another and how we, you know, those that are true disciples of Christ and that following in, in his example and that embrace the gospel message as I believe it should be understood that we are to come from a a perspective and a, a an angle of love and to deal with one another in with that kind of regard and that kind of concern, and that those that are not um, true believers and that only you know act um, as if they're Christians that they come from the other angle and that truly uh, the other aspect of this particular teaching is that we are told in the scripture and you know this is what i'm often criticized for more than anything else is that there most certainly are two different peoples here on the earth and that the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent that this would play out throughout the history of modern humanity until christ comes again for the harvest and so for those that deny this as an aspect of the gospel truth and the gospel narrative in in my opinion they don't know what they're talking about and that if you are really wanting to understand the fullness of Scripture, that it's imperative to have this as understanding and to share this as revelation. Because otherwise, um, you just don't really understand who the enemies of us are and that we are not all the same, that there are not, everybody's not concerned for the well-being and the goodwill, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and establishing a safe um, place for the children to grow up and nurture us and to, you know, become good and kind-hearted people themselves. Now, there are, there is another people ruling from the shadows that are only interested in rape, pillage, and plunder and oppressing us and causing torment and ruling over us and creating um, discord and sowing turmoil and, you know, controlling the opposition and keeping us distracted from truth. And Yeshua is very specific about who they are, and he ties um, who they are to the story of the begotten of Eve, because that is the source. That is the beginning of 
their origins as a people. And it begins with the enmity between Cain and Abel. But anyways, um, just to well, establish, and, go ahead. Kevin. And, you, and you can still see them at work, you know, in the world today. Absolutely. Very much so. That's what we were saying just a little while ago about, you know, the bankers and um, the control, you know, the small number of elites have control over this world. And, you know, they're bringing it to a new world order and, and things that we've been watching for a very long time and that is for that is prophesied in the bible exactly and that's the other aspect the important aspect of this teaching is that it helps you to understand what we see in world what we see reflected in what is happening with all, all of these e elites being of these bloodlines intermarrying in you know um considering themselves above us and uh, all of us as the useless eaters, it is reflected in what they say of themselves and what they teach, even to their own bloodlines, which, you know, I've shared many times the, the passages which talk about the differences of the three-strand and two-strand DNA and all of that, um, which is also an aspect of my work. But um, I'll go ahead and read and go into this, and, and we'll comment as we go. In 1 John verse, chapter uh, 3, verse 3, And every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, going back to the beginning, what is, uh, what is Yeshua talking about? He's talking about the beguilement of Eve because that's what led to the birth of Cain. And who was Cain? He was the son of the devil. This is why it says that uh, in the scriptures also that he was a murderer from the beginning. It's associating Cain with Satan. Um, and I, I'm not going to go, you can go into and read Genesis chapter 3 for yourself. And where it talks about in verse 315, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Well, that enmity played out with the birth of Cain as the firstborn hybrid son of the devil, and he murdered his half-brother, the firstborn son of Adam, Abel, which is also why um, you see Cain, his name means acquired. When you look it up in the Strongs, it means acquired. And as in a stepchild being acquired in, you know, when you... Uh, take on a wife and you she has children from other um, husbands in this case satan that he becomes your acquired son and then when you look up the name for abel which means breath that uh adam as in uh, adam being married in breath to his body which was created of the dust and then if you look up the name for seth it means substitute. And Seth was the substitute for Abel because he was killed by his half-brother, Cain. And so that's also why it says in Genesis in chapter 4, I believe verse 27, that Seth was the replacement for Abel and also that he was in Adam's likeness and similitude, whereas Cain was not. And so uh, one other... One other thing here, and then I'll get you to comment, Kathy. And uh, it's talking about Yeshua being the redeeming for the fall. In the wisdom of Solomon, 
verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. For God created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity. Nevertheless, though, envy of the devil came death into the world, and they that do hold on his side do find it. Um, Paul, he said this, by one man sin had entered into the world and death by sin in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. The fall was the murder of the human race, and it is in reference to this, of which the fratricide in the first family was a signal result that the tempter is called a murderer from the beginning. Cain was of that wicked one and slew his brother. That's First John um, in, uh, in, in chapter 3 verse 8 through 12, which we'll get to here in a second, where the thought is expanded. The reference to the murderer is suggested here by the fact that the Jews had been seeking to kill our Lord in John chapter 8, verse 40. They are true to the nature which their father had from the beginning. And that's from commentary on BibleHub.com on um, John chapter 8, verse 44, where it speaks of, uh, he says that you are of your father, the devil. Kathy? Well, the most basic thing that I think uh, you and, and Jonathan, uh, when you've done the shows with Jonathan Kleck, that you brought forward was the meanings of words and just exactly. going to the strongs. And here I just encountered this experience with someone who just flat out didn't understand that that it's the equivalent of, well, it's an index of all the words and, and how they were translated with the different variations, kind of thinking like an amplified Bible, how it gives you all the different, you know, in, in one um, version. It's kind of similar to that, but you look and you see what, what the meaning of the word is. And that is at the basic level what you have done and connected you know other appropriate information but at the basic level it's just looking at the strong's definition or the meanings of names and for people to deny that is very glaring in how dumbed down and how um our refusal to even look beyond our noses at something. They just read the plain text and that's how they take it and they won't go any deeper and you're a heretic. And, and right. so, you know, that's, I had itchy, I mean, I, I was told I had itchy ears and I wanted to retranslate the Bible just because I wanted to look at what the meaning of the word was from the Strong's. Right. And, and this is what I see in other commentary because I rarely comment on YouTube videos. But um, that's what I see in, in from some of these so-called authorities. They're they're saying, you know, no, this is a bad text, and they don't give any reference. They don't give anything more, and that's that's not good. That doesn't teach people. It, you don't get gain any understanding, and they actually are going off in the wrong direction. And then to top it all off, they will throw in slander and a character assassination of you, of Jonathan, and and anyone else that they don't agree with. So right. that's kind of what I see. Yeah, and so for those people uh, that follow these kind of characters and that listen to their work, ask them why they don't believe. And not just, well, because it's Gnostic or it's unbiblical. Why is it... Uh, well, even though Gnostic is not a negative term and they don't even no, understand that, uh, meaning knowledge and wisdom, but, you know, they use it as if it's a negative term when they don't even understand. I mean, that's that's ridiculous that they Let don't me, even know that. Go ahead. I, I pulled this up today because I was just looking at, you know, slander, false witness and, and that. And Ravi Zacharias wrote, this is just two paragraphs. And it's really important because a lot of these people are just kind of tailing, following along and repeating it. And they don't realize what they're doing, but they are also uh, bearing false witness. And he said, there are several ways in which false witness can be born. A person can help spread a rumor and thus join hands with a perpetrator. 
One can indulge false witness by turning a blind eye when truth is known. Someone can determine to bear false witness and therefore be guilty of premeditation. A person can simply fail to come forward with the truth or insinuate falsehood without actually saying it is so. And perhaps worst of all, a person can spread gossip about another, thus engaging in some of the worst forms of character assassination. The bottom line is that the bearing of false witness indicts the heart of a man. This is so serious, it is included in the seven things God hates, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Perhaps God knew that a failure to adhere to this commandment would easily lead to a barrage of sin against his name. So it's very serious. And I don't think people realize that. And the people who are leading them in this way are, are leading them down a path into grave sin. I agree. And, and that brings me to something else that I wanted to share. Because, you know, I sent this to Jonathan because I know he gets attacked all the time, even more than me, which is, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine, but uh, yeah, he does. But I sent him this from the Gospel of Bartholomew, which I thought was a very interesting passage. And it says this, Bartholomew saith unto him, declare unto us, Lord, what sin is heavier than all sins. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that hypocrisy and backbiting is heavier than all sins. For because of them, the prophet said in the psalm, that the ungodly shall not rise in the judgment, neither sinners in the counsel of the righteous, neither the ungodly in the judgment of my father. Verily, verily, I say unto you that Every sin shall be forgiven unto every man, but the sin against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. And Bartholomew saith unto him, What is the sin against the Holy Ghost? Jesus saith unto him, Whosoever shall decree against any man that hath served my Holy Father hath blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. For every man that serveth God worshipfully is worthy of the Holy Ghost. And he that speaketh anything evil against him shall not be forgiven. And so it's not that, you know, attacking the Holy Ghost, but it's attacking your brethren, those that are actually working on behalf of the kingdom, that are trying to bring forth truth, that are trying to help people to understand the scriptures, to gain insight into Yeshua as Savior Messiah and why the prophecies and the gospel and uh, the scriptures are important for us to know. Because, you know, this world is an illusion. Our eternal inheritance is what is important. And so for those that are trying to make and help people to understand that, you know, and and we're you know, all these people are attacking others, you know, we're all followers of Christ and we're supposed to be coming and uh, embracing each other in love. Uh, again, the who was the accuser of the brethren? Satan. Those are his actions, not not Christ. Christ said to come from a place of love. And he said the which we'll go into the fullness of the law is, is to love God and then to love your brother as you love yourself, your neighbor as you love yourself. Um, so, but before we do that, I want to share one other thing. And this is in regard to the Targums again in talking about these two different bloodlines. Uh, because, again, when you study from the Targums, which are these very ancient Aramaic translations of the original Hebrew Torah, you get a full, fully different understanding as to those passages which are, in my opinion, misunderstood and misrepresented in the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, and the reason they are misunderstood is 
is just because we don't have the fullness of the story again. Just like with First John chapter 3, where it says Cain, who is of that wicked one. And, uh, and then in Second Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul is talking about the, the beguilement of Eve and how she was not a chaste virgin. Uh, and then in Matthew chapter 13, with regard to the, the parable of the kingdom, the enemy that snuck into the garden and that sowed the tares. Uh, and then he, you know, clarifies that the, the tares are the children of the enemy uh, and the enemy is the wicked one, the devil. Um, all that is so very clear, but, you know, people always fall back on Genesis 4.1 as being, oh, it doesn't say that. It says that Adam knew his wife even uh, that she conceived and bare Cain. But this is what the Targums say, again, which predate the King James by 1,500 years. It says this, And Adam knew Haba, his wife, who had desired the angel. And she conceived and bare Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. And then she added to bear from her husband, Adam, his twin, even Abel. And so what is the passage that is missing from the King James? Who had desired the angel. Who is that angel? It's the serpent, the angel Samael, the angel of death, which is what the Targums reference as the Nakash being, is Samael, the angel of death, which in the Gnostic, the Gnostic text, the Nakamati Codices, that is the name for the Demiurge, the ruler of this world, um, in which we know that you know Satan has been given all the kingdoms of this world, which is why he was able to offer them to Yeshua if he would just bow down and give him a little homage, which he wouldn't. And so, I mean, all these things are affirmed. And so the Gnostic text, the Targum text, they're telling you exactly what the canon itself is telling you, but it's misunderstood. And so this is why I believe it's important to study these ancient texts, these ancient sources, in order to understand the fullness of the canon and to see plainly what is contained therein. Because even though all this extra biblical material, extra canonical material, affirms all of these things as truth, I can teach you about the serpent seed from the canon in itself, only right. the canon, uh, right. without Dr. having Joy to go in. Exactly. Yeah. Dr. Joy, uh, Pastor Arnold Murray, who you know had one of the largest uh, online television ministries and satellite ministries, he teaches this as well. And there have been many people that have taught this same thing uh, only from the canon and from the King James version of the text, uh, without having to go into all of this extra biblical material. But when you do read and you study from them, you gain incredible insight, which is why I share them and why I incorporate them into my work. I'm going to read one last thing, and then I'll get you to comment. Uh, this is Genesis chapter 5 from the Targums which it will make clear uh, what we're talking about here. And um, it says this, And Adam lived 130 years and begat Sheth, who had the likeness of his image and his similitude. For before had Hava born Cain, who was not like to him. And Abel was killed by his hand. And Cain was cast out, neither is his seed genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. But afterwards, there was one born, one like him, and he called his name Sheth. And the days of Adam after he begat Sheth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. So there, it, it tells you how... Cain was not in the similitude or likeness of Adam, and that Cain was not like him, and that Cain's seed, neither he nor his seed, 
are genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam, which again, when you understand that it was Eve having desired the angel, which led to the conception of Cain, it makes sense then that Genesis chapter uh, 4 verse 1 is found where it is because Genesis chapter 4 <clears throat> as a chapter is where Cain's lineage is listed and it's his lineage which is separated from Adam's lineage which begins in Genesis chapter 5. One of my favorite verses is Proverbs 25 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And I think that this is so true of everything that um, the research that you've gone into, just things that um, we're learning in the last decade or so, and even in the last couple of years, it's amazing what we are learning. And I, I think for people to, to, just rest on what they knew growing up and, you know, were taught in church, they're, they're going to be left, you know, really left without any knowledge and understanding. I, I agree. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back everybody for a final segment. It's a uh, very, the show's been going by very quickly, but uh, I want to go back to First John uh, chapter three again, because uh, because I want to show the distinction between the seed of the woman and the seed of Cain, and the actions, the behaviors, um, the the ways of being, their inclinations. And so, uh, back to verse eight: He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Notice that that he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Um, again, and um, somebody, and I'll share some of the passages from the chat room pretty soon. But this is, you know, again, verse 13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he hath laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. 
and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Now, so what is the law? What are the commandments? It says this, whosoever goes against the smallest of the laws of Moses, teaching men to do the same, will be named least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who keeps the law of Moses, teaching others to keep them, will be named great in the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. And here's what Yeshua said of the fullness of the law. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so there you see uh, all these people that are coming at others from a point of hate and think that they are holier than thou and that they have some uh, watchman's prerogative to attack and condemn others, they're coming from a place of hate. And this, Yeshua says, is what the sons of Cain and the children of wickedness and perdition and what the what Satan himself does as being the adversary of man, the accuser of the brethren. Kathy? Well, and I think, uh, like you just read from that one text, that, you know, we have the Holy Spirit within us, and we discern that um, that spirit that's coming from this. I know when I see these comments, I mean, I'm physically disturbed. And I get, you know, just a, a small handful compared to what you've ever had to deal with. And it, it frustrates my mind, and it, it makes me very upset and uncomfortable. And I try and, and very carefully respond to people but there is a definite spirit of hatred and, and judgment coming from um, a person that will do that without thinking with, I mean, tossing out that not in my Bible or, but they haven't read their Bible. They, they aren't paying right. attention it to is what in Christ. Their Bible. <laughs> exact, exa well, that too, but the, the spirit that they're talking and responding, I mean, cause I said, I'm your sister in Christ. You know, why are you talking to me in that, in that tone, I just suggested, that, you know, uh -huh. I don't understand, you know, you might pray for some peace. Uh, James 4 11 says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The yes. one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. So I, it's, it's very disconcerting. And I don't, I don't think, you know, I would have that special discernment, but I mean, I can see it coming off the page when I go to these, you know, channels or, you know, it used to be a great community and kind of building, but all of a sudden they've decided they have, you know, they have a job to attack and tear right. down. You know, if it's not you and Jonathan, it's somebody else. And I mean, they go on for hours and hours and hours and it's just talk. It's not learning. It's not, you know, going to the word. It's just talk. And it's just people who like to hear themselves talk. And, yeah, you know, talk about tickling ears, huh? <laughs> exactly. You know, I've, I and you and I have spoken about this before, trying to, you know, reach out in friendship and, you know, hey, love one another. But, you know, it's it's not something that's that seems to be going away. Although, you know, Link pointed it out, it's it's what we should be you know, it's in the Bible. We expect this at this late right, hour. Exactly. You yes. know? Yeah. Right. But you hate to see your brother going that path. And I would encourage them to stop. I would encourage anyone following them to stop. 
Right. You know, I'd like to see it kind of dry up, but then see, that's the other thing that I noticed in, and there's some, um, articles and resources online that I noticed this with as well. And I steer very clear of them, but they are uh, constantly, it's, it's kind of like their bread and butter. They attack people. Right. And, and, but then what I noticed too, is the people who follow along, they just kind of jump on and it's, it's not a good spirit at all. It's, it's not what I would expect to see from our Christian brothers and sisters. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like the whole, you know, the, the debate with the flat earth. I mean, that is, oh my gosh, there's so much of that rampant in all of that as well. I mean, it's like serpent seed number two. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> let me read this really quick. This was, um, it's a passage about, uh, about Satan and it, and it shows you also how, um, he comes from a position uh, of hate. It says this, he who under all circumstances is an adversary must certainly carry the principle of hatred in his heart. He moves about on the earth for the purpose of finding materials for his accusations and grounds on which he may raise suspicions. It is a characteristic feature that he whose darkness does not comprehend the light knows of no other piety but that which has its origin in the hope of reward. It is quite evident that it is the desire of his heart to destroy, to attack, and to maim. And I mean, uh, you know, for all these people that are coming from uh, that kind of scenario and that kind of position, why would you even give your time to listen to that? Why would you even dedicate, you know, in, even any of your precious moments that you could actually be studying the word and learning real truth to entertaining that? And it's just, it, is beyond me but it is what it is exactly um there was a question in chat from olive she wanted to know um let me see if i can word this right do we need the excluded books of the bible i think those would also be the the forbidden or the apocrypha pseudepigrapha and what about the nagamati codices do you think we we need those how would Re you explain really that? good question and yeah it is my opinion because the Nagamati codices have so much deeper, advanced truth, stuff that most people don't understand. And again, having studied it and read it myself numerous times, it's my opinion that they do teach and expound upon the deeper aspects of the teachings. And I can share some... Um, some of that here in just a minute. But as far as the Nakamati Codices too, if they are evil as so many people think and they're um, con contradictory to the scriptures, why would God even preserve them? Why would he allow right. them to be found? Just like with the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, because and even the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, because it was, you know, found in uh, in a controlled manner, it's one of the reasons why we don't have so much of the full text. They only gave us all the little fragments in the partial text, but like the full Aramaic version of the uh, the Book of Enoch, that's not released to the public. Um, and then even like you know the uh, all of these books, the Nakamati Codices, if they would have been found by those that are controlling they probably wouldn't have released any of those those books and those texts. Uh, it's only because they were found by, you know, somebody that was a shepherd um, that and they ended up getting into the hands of uh, people that wanted to share them with uh, the world that we even have that information. And it's like the Book of Enoch being rediscovered as part of the Ethiopic canon. Uh, if If the Book of Enoch was not inspired and God didn't want us to have it, why preserve it? Why allow it to be refound? Um, and so it's my opinion that not only the Nakamani Codices, but uh, um, the, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Enoch, 
And what I'm involved in as far as the translations of the Thracian Chronicles, which is a whole nother set of just incredible texts, uh, which I'll elaborate on at, at some future date, but all of this material, the Most High God preserved and is releasing in this day and age because we are the last generation. And another thing which God has impressed upon my heart is that the easy availability of the scriptures as we have them now, being able to just type in a keyword search and have the text pulled up in numerous different texts, that availability is at some point not going to be as easy as it is right now. And so for those of you that are just ignoring uh, access and availability and just not even wanting to read or study all this information, there's going to be a time when you won't have that luxury. So utilize it while you can. Study everything that you can because the access to wisdom and knowledge that we have right now is such a huge privilege and blessing, especially considering that the sons of Cain and the adversary and Satan, they have been trying to keep these teachings and this knowledge from us for so very long. And so, um, let and me get, yeah, sense. go ahead. That makes total sense. I was thinking too, you know, how the Miso the Smithsonian um, right. ha Museum ha has uh, hidden the skulls, the giant uh, skulls that have been found in or destroyed. We don't know for sure, but that's the kind of thing that the controllers, the elite, and they descend, you know, from like you're, you, you are saying, the bloodline of the serpent seed. Um, that there's a purpose, there's a reason. It's kind of like the uh, revelation of what the earth is shaped. <laughs> there's a reason that that's been hidden from us, and these things are coming to light now. Yes, exactly. Uh, secrets fact, revealed. <laughs> exactly, secrets revealed. And I'll, I'll share a passage from one of the books that were found in the Nakamati Codices, um, the book of Thomas the Contender, verse 39, it says this. Jesus said, the Pharisees and the scholars have taken the keys of knowledge and have hidden them. They have not entered, nor have they allowed those who want to enter to do so. As for you, be as sly as snakes and as simple as doves. And so, I mean, if that doesn't say it plainly and clearly, I don't know what does, but I'm going to share a couple uh, of verses from some of the Nakamati Codices, which show you the deeper aspects of the knowledge that is contained within them. All right, it says uh, this in verse 3. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. And it, again, it's a, a, that's about becoming born again and knowing and connecting with your Christ within you. The kingdom is within you. That spirit that is caught up in the flesh, if you connect with that side of you, that's the aspect of you that being born again and knowing Yeshua as Savior Messiah can have and take part in eternal inheritance. And that's the part after death that will go on to either the promise of paradise or the condemnation of Sheol. Because the body will return back to the dust. But we are not our bodies. We are not just our flesh. And that's what people have to come to realization on. That we are the Christ within us. That immortal aspect, that spirit that dwells within us. That's who we truly are. And that's the part of us that will go on beyond. I'll share a few more that talk about this kind of same thing. And these are teachings that people don't understand uh, because, you know, most everybody identifies with the flesh. In verse 22, it says, Jesus said to them, when you make the two one, 
And when you make the inside like the outside and the outside like the inside and the above like the below, and when you make the male and the female one and the same, so that the male not be male nor the female female, and when you fashion eyes in the place of an eye, and a hand in place of a hand, and a foot in place of a foot, and a likeness in place of a likeness, then you will enter the kingdom. And that's basically talking about uniting our inner and outer, our female and our male aspects, because again, as angels, we are both sexes, both male and female, a wholeness in union, in unity, um, the inner, the outer, the above, the below. It, it's talking about our glorified bodies because that's the part of us that will go on to the beyond. That's the part of us that will inherit paradise um, as long as we are so lucky and so inclined. <laughs> yeah. Another book from the Gospel of Philip, a few passages from it. The Lord said, Blessed is he who is before he came into being, for he who is has been and shall be. That, again, is connecting to our prior, our preexistence, and our who we were as spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual angelic beings before coming into flesh form. Just like Jeremiah chapter 1, verse um, uh, verse um, 4 and 5, where the word of the Lord goes to Jeremiah and says, I knew you before you ever entered into the womb of your mother. I have foreordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. He knew all of us before we ever entered into the flesh. We preexisted before our spirits were married with our flesh form. And this is one of those big secrets that is spoken about in great detail in the Nag Hammadi Codices, but which most people do not understand and miss, has everything to do with election and explains things, you know, things like Jacob uh, being favored and Esau hated when they had not yet been born. And uh, as children, how could a most high God, a compassionate, loving being, hate a child that not had not yet even been born and had not yet committed sin. It has to do with our preexistence, and those are things that a lot of people don't understand. Kathy? Well, I, I think there's so much there, and, and I do. I think it's really important that we understand those things, at least those of us who are really seeking truth and seeking to know more things about of God. And I wanted to read, because I don't think we read the full quote um, of condemnation prior to investigation, because it's really important. Uh, yeah, okay, let me read it. It's William Paley that gets mixed up a lot of times. That's uh, who said this. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. And biblically, Proverbs 18, 13, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly, it is folly and a shame unto him. Yes, exactly. And you know, when you were talking about that Proverbs, I wish uh, we had the full, you know, passage from the Strongs that that gentleman looked up and the way that he taught it. Uh, do you have the link for that video? Do you remember? The one that you shared with me on uh, Proverbs 18. Oh. Oh, it was so incredible, that teaching. Oh, I'll have to find that. Yeah, that was so good. We'll share it with everybody the next time. Um, but, yes, uh, definitely we'll have to share that. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll pull up the full verse and we'll share it with everybody next time. But, um, um, okay, uh, one last passage from the Gospel of Philip. Oh, we won't have time. We, we won't have time. Um, we'll pick it up next. Actually, it's going to be a couple weeks because David Carrico will be joining us next Wednesday to talk about the antediluvian age and for the following two, um, two Wednesdays. And also, David Weiss will be joining us this Saturday on Secrets of Yield, uh for a follow-up on what we did here. Uh, last Wednesday. So please do join us and 
Uh, thank you, Kathy, again for joining me, sister. It was a privilege to share time and space with you and all the listeners in the chat room, especially those of you that um, stand up for truth and that don't allow others to bully you or push you around. Know that we appreciate you and we stand with you and that we stand for, with God and with Christ and with the Holy Spirit and the, and for love and for truth and for understanding and compassion and empathy and discourse and learning, you know, instead of just condemnation and criticism and judgment and um, not seeing the, the, you know, judging others and holier than thou and all that. All right. God bless all. Good God night. God bless you. Good night. Looking and trying to come to what truth really is. I found this quote from somebody, and I thought it was appropriate and interesting. It says this, uh, how to find truth. The truth can only come from a source without the filters of time, proximity, translation, or bias. True truth or absolute truth cannot be told one to another, nor can it be read and discerned by a man living in the here and now without outside influence of a of a being devoid of filters. So the only truth can come from a supreme being that can see all and know all regardless of time and space. God being omniscient is the source of all absolute truth. One must read the scriptures but can misinterpret them if not guided by the Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Careful and prayerful scripture reading can and will provide truth actually revealed by God using the scriptures as catalysts. And in James chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Kathy, would you like to comment? Um, I was looking earlier. There's a, a Bible that I've had called Sefer. I don't know if you're aware of it. Um, it's a, a friend of mine, actually, she and her husband are part of the publishing, um, group of that book. And, you know, for those that, uh, you know, value my work and that value the ancient texts and that like myself have, um, deemed that in order to glean truth, that we really should go to the ancient sources and to the, accounts the visions the prophecies of the ancient prophets that um you know what better confirming witness is there for god uh, god's testimony and the the gospel as shared by the various patriarchs and prophets i mean what better way to learn truth and to learn about the creator and creation than from the narrative which was inspired and handed and passed down through uh, the prophets through time and generation. And so that's all that I'm trying to do is provide you that material. Um, and it's been impressed upon my heart that, you know, we are very blessed, fortunate, and lucky, and essentially spoiled because we have access to all of this information, whereas in generations past people have been subjugated have been um controlled and placed into a bubble and not given the keys to the kingdom not even allowed to 
read the scriptures for themselves for the longest time. The the masses uh, were kept out of the loop as far as you know having translations which they could read and study from for themselves, and they always had an intercessory, an uh, intermediary, somebody that they had to go to in order to gain insight. These supposed vicars of the of Most High God, you know, like the Pope and the Catholic Church, and information has been controlled for thousands of years, and it's only now um, recent, you know, with the the printing press and the publication of all the scriptures and the uh, just mass production of all of these various uh, stories and scriptures and biblical texts and and just wisdom texts and not just from Christianity or Judaism but from all over the world, all the cultures, all the peoples, all the civilizations, and so since that time there has been a flood of information which has come forth that has allowed people that are interested and in wanting to know that are willing to put forth the effort it allows us to gain insight into what truth is and what it may be and so you know we're very fortunate and very lucky and in looking at what truth means, and I'll get you to comment on this here in a, in a second, Kathy, but I just want to set the premise for the the show. In looking up the definition for the word truth, you it, it reads as, uh, truth is most often used to mean being in accord with fact or reality or fidelity to an original or standard. And uh, Truth may also often be used in modern context to refer to an idea truth to self or authenticity, the truth, the real facts about something, the things that are true, the quality or state of being true, a statement or idea that is true or accepted as true. And um, in Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, you don't need to expect us, we're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths skirting shores thinking world flat and with the island girls in celebration of new religion nobody led me or said this way i sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion fate for deliverance confidence enough to assess new disposition Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. Hear, O oh my people, my Torah, incline your ears to the utterances of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a proverb. I will declare riddles from ancient times, which we have heard and known and which our fathers told to us. We will not hide it from their sons, recounting the Psalms of the Lord to a later generation and his might and the wonders that he performed. And he established a witness among those of the house of Jacob, and he decreed a Torah among those of the house of Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their sons, so that another generation, sons still to be born, should know they will arise and tell it to their children, and they will place their hope in God and not forget the works of God, and they will keep his commandments. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen, and I'm happy and honored to be joined this evening by Kathy Dunson. Kathy, are you there, sister? Yes, I'm here. Good evening. Well, I hope you feel better. Oh, um, thanks. <laughs> but most certainly, you know, to all, if it gets too much for you, just let me know. Um, 
Okay, if I fall down, I'll yelp out. <laughs> right. All right. Well, um, this evening, the the show and the topic is about truth, the ancient text, and also condemnation without investigation, which there seems to be a lot of that going around. Definitely no shortage of it. And, um, and I'm not usually ever one to get involved in, you know, the, the very many people, which there are numerous ones that attack me, um, even daily sometimes, but that are just, um, you know, condemning me for bringing forth truth from the ancient texts and sharing that with you, um, because that's basically all that I do is study from the ancient texts and in sharing the things that I've learned, the discernment that I've been blessed by the Most High to now have and the revelations which I've been led to, I am just basically uh, sharing with you the things that I've learned and then quoting from all of these ancient texts. And in the books that I write, that's exactly what I do as well. I share what I've learned, and then I give you all the source references. And in each one of my books, there are hundreds. And so uh, 